There we go. And if you guys could all mute yourselves, I'm going to do my best for all the other people that are coming in, Kathy, after you leave, uh, letting them in. But yeah, because you need to co host me if you want me to let them in, because I'm not co hosted right now. Let me do that. I don't think I'm mm -hmm. trying to. Okay, I'll let them in. Okay. All right, Amy, count us in. Serenity now. Serenity now. Let's make Zoom. sure. This works. Okay. Breathe out. So much to do. Okay, the sound is there. Cassie Dixon's here. Beautiful. Dorothy Yuki's here. Suzanne's ready to dance. Let's go. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday. So come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday. We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's sunny in Seattle. Yay! And uh, this is Feedback Friday, episode 131. Wow. Really? 131? That's incredible. Well, welcome. I'm Kathy Hottori, president of Botanical Colors. And alongside Amy Dufo, Amy's in Cape Cod, I'm in Seattle. Uh, Amy's our communications director. We are really pleased, excited, and thrilled to welcome Cassie Dixon, a coverlet weaver, flax and silkworm farmer and artisan extraordinaire. Um, before we hand it over to Cassie, I'd just like to say a little bit about Feedback Friday and give you some reminders. Uh, Feedback Friday is our show where we speak with dyers, artists, scientists, writers, activists, scholars, farmers, uh, anybody who has to do with the world of natural color <clears throat> and dyeing. So I'm um, D-Y-E dyeing. Um, so we're so pleased to have you join us. and. Just a few reminders. Um, we have an interesting class on, well, we had a really great class on how to make uh, black from tannins and uh, get these amazing dark, dark gray shades, blacks, purple blacks, purple grays uh, with Cara Marie Piazza. That was last week. And we just announced as well that she's going to be teaching uh, kind of a, um, I would say the next level workshop and that is cosmic nebula and so she has a special technique that she teaches how to get really beautiful um sort of galaxy-like patterning on your fabric using some really simple techniques but so effective really interesting for um kind of if you want to dress up a little bit and you want something interesting to wear it's, it's a simple way to get uh, really nice patterning on your fabric. Um, so that's open now. If you're interested, I would encourage you to check that out. Um, of course, I don't know what the date is. November, early November is, or mid-November is when it's going to be held. It is a recorded workshop, meaning that she'll do a live demo uh, and then it will be recorded. And then um, the other thing that we have, a, a little, a few left is that um, I'm going to the Julie Beeler Mushroom Workshop uh, today, like right after this announcement, actually. And um, we, we had some extra mushrooms that we had collected over the years that we, we released on the site. There are still a few packages available. And <clears throat> as we obtain more, we'll be releasing more. So kind of keep your eye open for that because they go pretty quickly. But I know that we still do have a few um available right now. Um, and we also have some mushroom books and lichen books available. And last but not least, um, Amy is going to be at the New York Sheep and Wool Festival in Rhinebeck 
um, which every, anybody who knows me knows that I've been trying to get to that thing for like most of my adult life. I finally got to go last year and it was incredible. The weather was beautiful. They had things, things called cider donuts. I mean, <laughs> you have got to try those. <laughs> they were really super delicious. And uh, it was just really great to be around so many growers and really exciting to see so many natural dyers there. So if you can get there, go. It's amazing. Um, she's going to be there with in a the, bunch yeah, of 4-H, fiber 4-H. sheds. Yep. She's going to be in the 4-H building with tons of fiber shed people, all inspiring, all exciting. So try to go. Um, Amy's the moderator on this chat and she'll be on this call and she'll be monitoring the chat. She'll open up the chat after Cassie's presentation. Uh, and then everyone will be muted for the presentation, but we'll open it up afterwards um, so everyone can say hello and goodbye. This call is being recorded. We'll have it ready for you to uh, view. I'm going to watch it because I won't, I won't be here. Um, and I can't wait to hear what Cassie has to say. Um, just a little bit about Cassie. Um, so I don't know how I saw Cassie's work, but I was just like astonished how beautiful it was when I did see it on Instagram and the the level of detail and ability to really, I have a barking dog, I'm sorry. He thinks he needs to also speak. Um, it, the level that she had in terms of what she was doing and, uh, with these coverlets and counterpanes was amazing. So she is a Southern Highland Craft Guild Heritage member. She specializes in spinning, traditional weaving, and natural dyeing. She's called Western North Carolina her home for over 30 years, and she lives right near the Great Smoky Mountains, which if any of you have ever traveled that way, also another incredibly beautiful, culturally rich uh, area that is, is, is so special because it's so American, you know? Um, she's a traditional pattern weaver, and she's been uh, weaving coverlets and linens for over 40 years. Today, she's going to talk about how she's been growing flax and using 18th and 19th century tools to process the fiber to weave linen cloth. So Cassie, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so pleased to have you. I can't wait to hear your story. Great. Right. Thank you, Kathy, Amy, and everybody who's tuned in today. Um, are you, are, I'm waiting for the, there it is. Are no, you ready? Are you ready? I'm ready whenever. Okay. And I thank right. everyone. Okay. Let's see. We're going to home. We're going to go to the slideshow. We're going to play it from the start. <laughs> all right. It's all you. Okay. Well, as, as with all the crafts that I create, I'm grateful to a series of women who've inspired me and helped me along the way. My grandmother was first. She taught me to sew, embroider, and do all types of needle crafts. And from that foundation, several women crossed my path at the opportune time. I became interested in spinning from a friend's mother while in graduate school in Wyoming. And then returning home, I learned natural dyeing from a close friend, Sandra Melsheimer in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where I was living, and later weaving from Helen Bryant. She was a local weaver uh, in Jackson, uh, Mississippi, who I saw weaving her natural dyed shawls at a guild event on the Natchez Trace. In 1978, I met Nona Ledbetter. She was a local weaver uh, in Vicksburg who wove coverlets and linens. And from the first minute she opened a chest of her weaving, I knew I wanted to learn how to weave these. Uh, she became my mentor and friend. I have many cherished memories of us sitting around her kitchen table, just doing the math involved in creating a woven coverlet. I've been weaving coverlets for over 40 years. I can't remember exactly, but close to 50 now. Uh, when I create these, recreate these historical patterns, it gives me a connection to the weavers of the past and their life stories. 
So what are coverlets? They're woven bed covers, sometimes called cover lids, or in Appalachian dialect, they were called kivers. The earliest dated coverlet that we know was woven in 1771. It's on display at the National Museum of the American Coverlet in Bedford, Pennsylvania. And it's a beautiful pattern woven in linen and indigo dyed wool. Prior to 1810, most coverlets were woven of linen and wool. And when weavers were able to obtain cotton thread, it freed them from the, the laborious task of processing the flax plant to linen thread. Coverlets were very popular between 1810 and 1860. There were still weavers who carried on the, these traditions of flax processing and coverlet weaving long after they were out of style, especially here in these Appalachian mountains where I live. The coverlets in the photo, if you start on the left-hand side, is a lover's knot pattern. And beside it in um, orange and blue, um, that is an eight harness wig rose pattern. And it was woven, I wove it in linen and wool. And below it, in the uh, matter, I dyed it with matter and the green, I don't know, you, you can't really see it, but the green, it's a green that was uh, dyed first with goldenrod and then um, over dyed with indigo to create the green in that coverlet. Uh, on the very bottom is an eight shaft blue um, in blue wool, uh, a summer and winter weave structure. And on the right, far right, is a pine cone bloom pattern that I've woven, oh goodness, at least 12 probably coverlets in that pattern. It was a very popular pattern and, and people really love that pattern. Next. Amy. In 2019, I was asked to weave a coverlet for a child's bed at the Arlington House in Washington, DC. And this one is a two panel coverlet woven in the King's flower pattern. And on the right hand side is the federal knot pattern. The coverlet, I wove it as a king size, um, 120 inches by 120. And I wove it in three panels. Mary Meads Atwater, who helped revive the hand weaving in America, she collected and published weaving drafts. And um, she published this draft in one of her first weaving bulletins, um, I believe it's number three. It was brought to, to Mary Meads Atwater by the great, great grandson of the weaver uh, Matilda Kimball Bacon. She was from Albion, New York, and she wove a coverlet just like mine, the one I wove in 1820. And interesting, the same pattern is in the book, Keep Me Warm One Night, Early Hand Weaving in Eastern Canada by Burnham and Burnham. Um, so it's about you know, a couple hundred miles up the river, the St. Lawrence River on the ca Canadian side of the border, it was woven. Uh, years ago, there was a local weaver here in my area who had moved from New York and had been living in uh, Western North Carolina for a while. And she was elderly. She had been a weaving teacher in New York and she wanted to give me all of her weaving collection, her looms and yarns and and weaving, and in her collection was an antique coverlet woven in this same pattern. So apparently it was very popular in New York and in Eastern Canada. And in fact, these patterns were shared widely in many of our states here in America. Next. I did a, an exhibit at the Carson Newman University, their Appalachian Cultural Center in two, uh, 2021. And all of the patterns you see here were woven on a four harness loom. And there's a picture of my, my loom in the center with a, the pattern is called Wheel of Fortune. 
but I have a Maycumber loom, as some of y'all are, are weavers, and it holds eight harnesses. And, but um, this is just a four harness pattern that's on it. Some of these patterns look very complicated, but uh, if you know overshot, it's not that complicated to weave overshot. The skill in weaving a coverlet is weaving panels in it's like three panels and to get them all to match and sew them together. And uh, that is, uh, I guess, an art. Next. This is uh, another pattern that I really just, I loved, I was intrigued with. It has over 1,100 threads just in one leaf. And the pattern is from um, key, uh, Of Coverlets by Wilson and Kennedy, which was a book uh, on the study of coverlets woven in Tennessee, uh, is 40 to the inch. And uh, I thread almost all of my coverlets, 36 to 45 to the inch, depending on the size threads I use. And uh, you can see the coverlet in the center is on a linen warp, and it was actually threaded 45 to the inch with linen singles that were 30 over one singles. It's like 9,000 yards and a pound of, of that linen. It's very, very fine. And I've woven three of these coverlets and um, they were, but I've seen them woven uh, in different states, Alabama, North Carolina, um, Tennessee. This coverlet pattern got around and it's I, I wove it not to put really on a bed. I wove it as a backdrop drop when I demonstrate and um, at craft fairs. And it's, it really is a conversation piece. People come up and they tell me all the time, I've heard more than once, it makes them dizzy. So it, it, these patterns will kind of move. Next talk a little bit about dye plants. Um, when I natural dye, I love to do like the dyers did before me. I look in my backyard. I not only dye with plants that are ready to use at that time, but I also dry and store plants for future use. Now the, the plant on the right, the, uh, the left, is uh, Queen Anne's Lace. I use Queen Anne's Lace at fresh and usually it's in July when it blooms here and in the mountains and it just gives gorgeous yellows. In the middle is broom sedge. It's the grass you see growing in the fields. Now in Seattle, I don't think it grows up that far north, but it grows over a wide area of the Southern states and you can kind of, um, and up in North Carolina and I don't know exactly how, how far up it goes up it, to the east, but it's a really powerful dye plant. And if you cut it green, like I do in September before it turns brown, it will stay green uh, forever, actually. I, I store it and use it whenever I need it. And um, it gives gorgeous yellows. And then blooming right now is fall asters and the white asters, I think give the, the prettiest yellows and I dry and store them also for future use. Uh, walnut hulls, I'm collecting them right now. I use them, I dye with them. I also have the bark and I use leaves. Uh, black oak trees, I had a tree grow, go down in a friend's yard and um, we harvested bark from it that will that I will have probably till I'm 100 years old. Um, hickory bark I've got and Osage orange I get from a, um, a fellow craftsman that makes knives and he gets, I think is Osage from the Midwest. I, I'm harvesting staghorn sumac for tannin. I dry the leaves and rhododendron, mountain laurel grow everywhere where I am and I can use them to get my my gray colors and a uh, weld, goldenrod, I use fresh. And a weld, I've grown weld, but I have a hard time where I am on this ridge top growing it. And uh, 
so sometimes I buy buy weld if I don't have enough on hand stocked up, and I do purchase dyes, cochineal, uh, matter. I love botanical colors, matter extract. I get beautiful deep reds from that every time I use it. Indigo, Kutch, and I I buy logwood. Um, I have it on hand uh, it for historical recipes. Next. And this is just a shot of my colors uh, that I use. The, the colors on the left uh, are linens and I've used, I use alum acetate, but I also love to use tannin. And sometimes I'll do the sumac uh, leaves for my tannin and uh, alum with washing soda to, um, for mortising my linen yarns. And then on the right-hand side are or wools that I'm dying for future coverlets. Um, be teaching a class at John C. Campbell Folk School next spring. I'm celebrating the folk art of Granny Donaldson. And it, I, you may not be familiar with her work, but she was a, quite an artist that specialized in crocheted and natural dyed yarns. And um, I'll be teaching a carbon weave class at the folk school with Nikki Reese in April. So there's always something new and interesting to learn. And every time I say not one more thing, I always run across one more thing I'm interested in learning. So, but I love natural dyeing and I, I always have a pot going. Next. I'm frequently called to analyze an old coverlet. One of my favorite co colors is olive green. These are two coverlets that I uh, recently analyzed that were woven in the early 1800s. One was from North Carolina and the other was from Tennessee. Both of them had very similar olive green co colors and um, they were both cotton warp and uh, tabby. And, and then the, the wool weft, the pattern thread was the color. And I, when I analyze a bedspread, I also like to know or get an idea of the dyes that the old weavers used. So I will go through the process of trying to match those colors. And if I know where they're woven, then I know the plants also that were in that area. These two, both of these two, I got that same exact yellow using a, a black oak and I did another experiment with goldenrod and um, I mortared with alum. I did not use cream of tartar because I used a post iron mordant after it that changed the color to the olive green. Next. This, this one was woven in 1775 and it's 248 years old. It had an indigo dyed linen warp and a white wool tabby and a copperous dyed wool for a pattern weft. It gives me great joy when I see something like this that I can actually analyze it and use and see these threads up close. This one came with a little note that it was a treasure and please keep a precious memory of my ancestors. It talks about the colors that, that they got it, that, that the yarn was dyed with copperus and indigo. I found two recipes. One was in um, a, a buff copperus yellow and the recipe was found in the Practical Family Dyer, written in 1858 by the Pennsylvania Germans. And I also found the recipe for Iron Buff in Jim Lyles' book, which is my go-to book for historical um, dyes. Uh, I, I knew Jim and um, he, he was a, I learned and studied from him and it was just a great, it, when I, I use it all the time for my go-to book for historical dyeing. But you can see in this recipe, uh, it was the, um, the, I dissolved the copperas in hot water and immersed the 
the solution and then I let it air dry and then I drew it through lime water. And in Jim's book, he used he used um, washing soda, like a, a, an alkaline, another alkaline substance. And it changed the color in linen. I actually put linen in my dye bath and got that same beautiful gold color on my linen. Okay, next. Okay, we're going to switch to my growing of flax. And um, I, the, um, let's see, where am I? The, the flax, you can see my little garden up there in the top left corner, uh, right corner. I usually plant a garden that's like five feet wide by 20, maybe 20, 25 feet long. And you see that the seeds are sown very close together. I can reach in when the plants are very young and pull out the weeds if there are any. And, um, and I usually plant around April 1st here in these mountains. And it's a uh, hundred days of growing to flax to maturity, but you pull flax a little earlier than, you know, if you want the finest and the, uh, the best fiber, you don't let it reach all the way to maturity because it'll be coarser. And you plant it early because the longer it goes into the heat of the summer, you know, you risk the fact that it may uh, be a little bit coarser fibers. But uh, I usually pull the flax around the third week of June and you can see it drying on the racks. Um, that's my driveway and my backyard is the redding process. And I, I, I can red immediately or I can store the flax indefinitely. And I have a lot of flax in my basement and uh, ready for redding at a future date or re-redding, which sometimes I do a lot is I read it so long and then I may re-red it again. I do, uh, I do a lot of experiments in using combination redding and, um, and you can go to the next process on the, on the next page and you can just kind of look at different dye lots that the redding, um, when you red, the, these are all do redded, which means that I've laid it out like the previous photo in the grass in the backyard and let the wind and the rain and the dew uh, create a mold that grows on the outer bark of the flax plant. And it's also coloring the flax fibers inside the flax. And um, from the top, you, the, the top is the darkest color. It was a, a really heavy mold. It rained a lot. You flip the flax over to try to get even rats and um, you can see how dark the fiber is. And then below it is also a winter ret, a little bit lighter shade, and then a spring ret. And, and below it is a, um, a winter ret, which gives you blonde. And Dale Lyles, Jim and Dale Lyles, um, Jim that wrote the book, The Art and Craft of Natural Dying, and Dale, his wife, uh, Dale and I got to be very close friends, and after Jim passed away in the early 2000s, um, Dale and I just bonded. She was a very close friend and my mentor when it comes to growing flax. She, um, she taught me so much, and she loved to winter rat, and I, I frequently winter rat in January and February when it's cold, you get low mold and you're gonna get shades of blondes. And um, I, I sometimes in the summers do water rat in pools and let, and that's gonna give you shades of blondes. But each one of them create a dye lot. And you can see on the right hand side, all the different colors. Next. This is just uh, some examples of my weaving and the uh, uh, flax to linen. Uh, I spin linen singles and I weave with linen singles. And um, this is on the le left hand side is um, a twill bag and a huck pattern and some hand spun linen. In the middle is a vest I wove that is Lindsay Woolsey, which means 
a linen warp and a wool weft. And I used yarn um, linen from my homegrown flax. It's threaded 40 to the inch. If some of y'all are weavers, uh, the threads are very fine and it's uh, singles. It's also singles wool and you can see an up close of the weaving um, in the herringbone pattern. All right, next. This is just some other uh, examples. Uh, the, the photo on the left is a part, um, is, it was flax from the Berta's Flax uh, Project. And some of y'all may have heard about this. It, it, um, it's, a, a, it's a project that was started by a lady in Austria. It was from Berta, who was a, a farmer's daughter. And she had a chest full of uh, flax that was given to her when she married over 80 to 100 years ago. And that chest of flax was given to a lady in Austria and she sent it out, asked if people were interested. And it's a, it's a fascinating story of people that were interested all over the world. And all you had to do uh, was write to her and ask her if, if tell her how much you wanted and pay for the shipping. I think it's still going on today because more people had donated flax from other uh, diaries that had been collected in Austria. And so it's you can read about it online. And I think it was in one of the spinning and weaving magazines, a whole article written about it. On the right hand side is a, one of the coverlets I wove in linen and then some more of my linen textiles that I've woven in traditional patterns. They're all singles, uh, hand spun singles and um, uh, M's and O's, um, a huck and spot weave are traditional linen patterns that I like to use. Next. And this is just another up close of singles linen in a um, spot weave pattern, M's and O's and um, a spot weave pattern. And lastly, I want to talk about the artisier culture or silk farming. We have a history of silk in this country that not many people know about, but in the 1600s, King James commanded the colonists to raise silkworms. A hundred years later, Ben, ben Franklin was uh, promoting sericulture instead of growing tobacco. And uh, by 1800, there were over 300 silk mills in this country. Different religious sects like the Shakers of Kentucky, the Harmonists, the Mormons, all practiced sericulture and wove beautiful fabrics. By 1826, three out of every four households in Mansfield, Connecticut were raising silkworms for silk production. And I got started in 1990, I saw an article on silk, one of the spinning magazines, and there, there was a lady in California, Nancy Simpson, I, th she, I think she was from Sacramento. She was raising silkworms, traveling all over the world. Um, and getting different varieties. And I was so curious, I wrote to her, I asked her to send me some eggs and a pamphlet on what to do. And I, I tried it that year, it was incredible, just going through self-discovery and, um, and just doing the whole process is just so fascinating. I've been raising them for 33 years now Every month of May and June, I raise silkworm, and that's when the mulberry leaves are on the tree in my area. These worms, they're actually caterpillars, are Bombex mori, and their name means the mulberry silkworm. Uh, they're totally uh, domesticated, and after 5,000 years of breeding, they don't know to get out of their little tray to go look for food. If you don't feed them, they're going to die. So they live indoors in open trays and they wait for you to feed them. And the only time that they'll leave the tray is when they're looking for a place to spin and I make them little 
little homes out of cardboard, uh, paper towel ro rolls. And, you know, sometimes I just put them in paper sacks with paper towels and they'll spin cocoons in there. But I use my silk for weaving in scarves and shawls. I use it for embroidery. And you can see the natural dyed silk yarns on the right hand side. And um, I want to say if a silkworm can't find a corner to spin in, they will spin flat silk. And there's a, a group of, um, let's see, it's in Weizhou, China. It's the Miao people. They, they trick their worms into spinning sheets of flat silk and then they natural dye the sheets of silk and then cut it up and use it as embroidery uh, for their traditional outfits. And uh, I have, all this is on my Instagram page. I have, I usually post things that some, I, I even have silkworms coming out of their cocoons um, double that have spun double, um, the, uh, to make dupiani silk cloth is when you, when two silkworms spin together and everywhere they touch as they're spinning inside the cocoon, it makes a little nub. And that little, that dupiani two, two worms spinning is, makes a, a beautiful, beautiful silk cloth. Now you do not have to kill the pupa inside the cocoon to be able to use the silk, but you will not be able to unravel it if, if, the, pu if the pupa uh, changes to a moth and comes out. So there are numerous ways to use the silk. Uh, sometimes I, what I'll do is I'll just cut the tips off the cocoons. I'll shake the pupa out and let, let the pupa, you can watch metamorphosis right before your eyes, the whole process of the silkworm emerge. You know, the, the cocoon just protects the silkworm. And so uh, you can take the pupa out and let it just go on through the, the process of emerging as a moth in 12 days and, um, and watch the whole process. And then the moth mate, um, they lay their eggs right there. They don't fly. They lay their eggs on the paper towel that I put out for them. And then I roll up the paper towel after a week the eggs turn brown and they're fertile. I put them in the, a little glass jar in the refrigerator. And next spring, I take them out again and let them hatch. And the whole process starts all over again. So if anybody's interested, I can give them links uh, to where to go to find out more about raising silkworms. And, um, and also the flax to linen and coverlets. So I'm open for questions with anybody. All right. that, that's a, that was a lot to cover in 30 minutes, but. but no, that uh, was, that was wonderful. It was like perfect, perfect timing and beautiful story. I wrote some questions down too. You guys bear with me for a second here. I'm going to, without Kathy here, I'm trying to do a couple things. I would have opened the chat up already. So I'm going to open it right now. So you guys can put your questions in chat, but I'm just going to. I wrote two down just in, until the questions start coming in, Cassie. But one of the things you said at the very beginning, where yes. you're talking about kind of all the all the colors that you're blending, which I thought was was all the colors that you create are so beautiful. But do you have sort of like go to colors that you're using now? Do you or do you sort of make uh, colors all the time? Well, I've been na I natural dye. I, I tell you, I have a pot just about going seems like all the time and especially in the summers before winter gets here. But, um, you know, just for future projects this winter and then getting ready for uh, a class at the folk school. But uh, this cover like here right here is Indigo. And, I, you know, I have dyed in the summertime when it's I got good, sunny, hot weather. And um, but I've been this month. I've been collecting my fall asters and um, uh, broom sedge, and dying with with just pl local plants that I don't I don't dry, but I I don't know. I, I love I, there's so many plants I use, and I keep them on hand all the time. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Because of course you talked about silkworms 
we got a bunch of silkworm questions, but you know what? One one of the things we talked about was I was going to share your um, your Instagram page, so you could just I just want to show Cassie's Instagram page, and I'm going to get down to those. Oh, here we go. You I have the worms. Yeah, I have the worms down there, and um, even just a video of the flax you know, demonstrating and, mm -hmm. and I, when I post a picture, I usually talk about the pictures. Yeah. I'm just trying to think there was some other really beautiful pictures because we, we didn't have a lot of, uh, there's a picture of, of the cultural Appalachian, uh, cultural center at Carson yeah. Newman. Okay. Um, some embroidery well, work and, and there's some of my woven silk and knitted silk. Like I said, you don't have to be a spinner. You can you can actually draft these fibers out of the cocoons and knit with them without spinning. Oh, here's where you're talking about where you're cutting cutting the um Yeah, and the watching the silkworms hatch. The, oh mo the moss, the moss before. hatch, the pupa sheds its skin one last time and then emerges as a moth. And um <laughs> everybody's like what on earth has happened this is so cool actually, oh everybody everybody ought to go in together and i mean i have a, a a lady that i get eggs from if i need them or i tell people that her website is Flour flourishing filaments uh, i think for 16 dollars, peggy will send um 200 eggs now i want to say that's like four trays and each moth lays can lay 250 to 500 eggs. I think my first mistake, the second year I, I uh, raised silkworms that I let a thousand hatch. And that is a 50 pounds of mulberry leaves. That is a lot of food to feed them. So um, it is labor intensive when you have a lot of worms to feed. Wow. You gotta have a food source. I think you're converting people. Uh, you can uh, you can buy um, uh, let's see coastal silkworms has mulberry chow and you can raise silkworms any time of year using mulberry chow it's microwavable food and um, I would rather <laughs> use fresh leaves but sometimes I start the worms out in April and in on mulberry chow and then switch to mulberry leaves and yeah. um and I wait till the leaves on the mulberry tree get really big so it, I don't have to have that many leaves to to feed them um but they you you can you can't go back to chow after they've had the luxury of eating mulberry leaves they won't go back to eating the chow okay well if you don't have those leaves you know now you can get chow mulberry yes Every you can you can do it and it is you got it, this. It's fascinating i think everybody ought to go through the process at least once yeah i'm thinking about yeah anyways maybe we'll, we'll start a support group for um <laughs> so we're, we'll, we'll have you lead Therapy that group. <laughs> yeah um, okay i'm gonna jump into some questions too um weft and tabby what is tabby oh okay on the overshot coverlet all right it is, you use two shuttles to weave overshot. If you're, well, you can use three col three shuttles if it's different colors, but let's say you're weaving a blue and white coverlet. Well, like for this one right here, um, a, an overshot, the, the one of the pattern, it go, it floats over threads that your warp threads on a loom it goes over the warp threads and so to make one block it may take thread three uh 10 different shots of going over that thread but every time you throw a thread of pattern weft you have to lock it down with a a a, a thread that goes over and under every single thread on the coverlet uh, on your warp threads is that's it's called overshot weaving so if you cut away the blocks in this right here there would be a ground fabric it, that was woven in the white and I don't know if you can see it but on the back side it's white and on this side it's solid 
And so that a, a, a tabby is the is the the thread that's locking those floaters in. I, I think I guess I've said it right. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. On processing linen for spinning, are there suppliers of fine hacklers, or is it best to just try and make your own? Uh, well, all of mine came from antique uh, stores or, um, you know, I, I, I see them, on, they're on eBay, but you, you know, you, you want something that's good. I've seen some, I, you should really, they shouldn't cost unless it's amazing a hackle that's, uh, but hackles you can get usually from 35 to a hundred dollars. And, um, but I would check. Um, you know, antique stores have them and that's where I have found them. Sometimes uh, auctions, um, you'll see auctions where they sell them. And I, I bought one time, I think I got like five or six for less than a hundred dollars all in one auction, um, oh, wow. that they were selling in Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. Let's see, um, how do you store your dyes and what what is the shelf life? I don't, I don't think there's a shelf life. I mean, my my I, I I've used them. I have I have Jim Lyles's. I ended up with all of Jim's um, natural dyes that he used his logwood and uh, cochineal, and um, so I, I I mean I still use those my. Uh, things that I collect, like my black oak bark and um, my uh, plants that I collect, um, like broom sedge, all of those, they, I, I haven't saved for years. And I, they're still really uh, strong dye plants. I keep, I have sacks of things in my basement uh, for uh, dyes. I'm just putting, I just put Jim's book in the chat that, that Cassie's talking about, that we, we actually sell it. And that's one of Kathy's favorite too. So For historical uh, dying, I, I really, I love it. Yep. There's also a question, I'm sorry, I just lost it. Okay, here it is, kind of talking about older, looking at old dyes and, and coverlets. Do the, somebody's asking if, I am intrigued by analyzing old coverlets. Do the colors change over time? Well, I tell you, if you could go, I haven't seen it. If it if they are natural dyed, unless they've just been left out in the sun or washed up over and over, if you go to the National Museum of the American Coverlet in Bedford, Pennsylvania, I I talk there every year. At we have something called Coverlet College. And if there are people that are interested in coverlets, we have a coverlet study group that meets once a month on Zoom. And uh, you can just send me a message and I'll be glad to tell you about it. Uh, but if you go in the museum, everything is natural dyed. And those coverlets go back to the 1700s and early 1800s. And the colors are vibrant and beautiful. And they have them hanging on the walls everywhere. It's, uh, it's, it really is just fabulous. And they, everyone that I see that I analyze, they're well, well worn and they still look incredible. The dyes still look incredible. Mm. Cassie, have you ever, when you're doing this analyzing of the coverlets, have you ever been stumped by where it comes from or what the dyes are? And, and maybe what's, what's your, what's the, well, one dye. Yeah, one dye I can tell you that has perplexed me that I, I I still I work on it all the time is a purple that was a dye recipe using rotten maple bark. And I'm going to tell you, I've tried every maple. I've tried it in all stages of rotting and I have not gotten purple yet. But I, I found I have old dye recipe books that I run across a dye recipe, I usually do it. I usually try it. And that is one um, recipe that I know uh, existed that people that 
people used and got it. It was dried, it was rotten maple bark with a little bit of copperas to make to go uh, to make it turn purple. And the closest I came was on a piece of cotton that was used as a tie on the wool. It was purple, but the wool wasn't purple. So I'm still working on that one. It's mm -hmm. um, one of those mysteries. Yeah. Okay, uh, Claudia is asking, on dyes, when you use the black chestnut, do you leave the meat in the hull? Yeah, I do. I just take the nut out and I, I use it fresh, green. Usually I use it green. I do a, a natural dye with walnut leaves. And also in the in the spring here, about May 15th, when the sap is rising in the trees, you can get walnut um, limbs and just the bark just peels right off. And I, I have bags of bark and um, I use copperas to help make it uh, a little darker. And um, also, sometimes if I want a deep, deep brown, I do an old Tommy way of doing um, a deep browns is dye first with indigo and get a deep blue and then over dye with, with walnut. Like I said, I, I follow a lot of historical recipes. I try them and um, to get different colors just like they did. Mm -hmm. There's another question. Some of the patterns remind me of Welsh blankets. Is there a historical relationship? Well, I would say that most of the Scotch Irish settled in the Appalachian Mountains, mostly, uh, and the Pennsylvania Germans and uh, came. The Germans uh, came into Pennsylvania, and they were incredible weavers. All. Our, our United States, when the immigrants were coming over from different countries, they all brought with them um, weaving techniques that they learned from their countries. What's interesting about coverlets in our country is that we know they were being woven in the early 1700s. And um, I mean, when I say the earliest one at the National Museum of the American Coverlet is 1771 because it's dated. It has the date woven in. But we know they were weaving earlier than that. We know that they brought with them traditions of weaving. But what happened in this country is all these patterns started just developing and weavers would just start. They just morphed into other patterns. And many of these coverlets, they all have a lot of names for the same pattern, depending on the area they were woven. But, um, but you see these patterns from Eastern Canada all the way down to the deep South. And they flourished in this country like no other country else in the world, um, you know, that had the, these type of bedspreads woven and all these different types of patterns. I hope I'm, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Oh, what indigo method do you, do you use? And have you have you done the urine method? I've tried the urine method, but usually I just I use a, a hydrosulfite vat or I use an iron vat. Both of them. What the iron vat for uh, linens. And I, I do dye linen a good bit. And um, I also love to use it natural. And, uh, and then wool, I usually, I use a, a hydrosulfite, you know, spectrolite vat. Okay. Uh, can you tell us about your wheel? Somebody's asking. Uh, my spinning wheel? Is that it? My I'm not spinning sure. wheel? I, I bought my spinning wheel um, for $50, it's an Ashford, and, um, in, in 1972, I saw somebody spinning, they had an Ashford wheel, a, a lady that taught me, uh, spinning, I had a girlfriend, I was living in Wyoming, and I'd been knitting and crocheting and everything, my grandmother, I was going to, uh, to college, and, uh, a friend invited me home to her mother's house, and her mother has spinning wheel and a loom. I never thought I'd be a weaver, 
I, I thought, yeah, that's too big a thing to carry with me. And spinning wheel, I was very intrigued by. I ordered an Ashford kit for $50 in 72, 73. And um, I still use it today. In 1980, Ashford came out with something called a high speed flyer. And I was spinning linen in the late 70s. So I, I knew I, I wanted to upgrade my, just the flyer part of it. And I did because I was spinning really fine, fine threads. And I thought I could get a, a, a faster, uh, a faster whirl. I could get a, a you know, a finer thread. So I, I did, I ordered that. And I have I ordered also the distaff that attached to it, but I have replaced it with another uh, old distaff that uh, just attaches to my Ashford wheel. And I do have another wheel that I use uh, that's a Canadian wheel, it's 1860 something, 62, I believe it's dated. And I use it, it has, for spinning really fine threads, but I use my Ashford most of the time. Okay. Do you spin your coverlet weft single ply? If I'm gonna use it for tabby or uh, I I just, now I will say this, right now I, um, I have a friend uh, at the folk school, Martha Owen, that had gave me a piece of a coverlet that was in her family. It was in a house, it burned down. It's just a little tiny scrap and that was left in the rubble. And it's a, it, it has a purple and brown pattern. I have figured out the draft. I bought a fleece from Martha and I've cleaned it and I'm spinning singles that are comparable to a 20 over two uh, coverlet wool, really fine wool singles. But that, if you, if you go back and look at this presentation at the olive green coverlets, you can see how fine those threads are. Um, I'm spinning this wool really, really fine. And if you know how wool is, it wants to ply, but the, the old time coverlet weavers wove singles and that's what I'm doing. And I'm gonna uh, reproduce the color that this coverlet was woven with. And I, I, I'm even thinking about using my, my um, spinning enough flax to weave it. And I would, I would, also, I would use singles. And that's what they did. They use singles. What kind of knots do do you use? Why am I having a hard time saying do you use do you use when you change colors? I don't do knots. Okay. Yeah, they, there's no knots. I I I run the, the thread up the side. Okay. Let's see. Um, what about dye plants? Uh, for example, goldenrod, how long can these plants give color? I like to, if I'm going to use goldenrod, I'm going to use it fresh when it's, and when it's really at its peak yellow. Yep. I know you can dry it, but it's definitely not going to be that. I don't ever yellow. dry goldenrod, but I'm sh maybe it can be done. You know, yeah. I, I don't. Sometimes I freeze uh, marigolds if I can't use them all. I, I'll freeze certain plants um, for later use. Mm -hmm. I actually have a whole refrigerator full of natural dye ice cubes. So you can always, you can always <laughs> just <laughs> make them into ice cubes too and use them later. Uh, I've heard dogwood bark makes blue. Is that true? Uh, never tried it. And I have, I've never seen a recipe for it either. Uh-oh, you're going to be doing that. Uh, what is a good source of these historical dye recipes? Well, I'd say Jim Wiles' book, if you're really interested in, in historical. And um, there, I mean, I have a lot of old books that are out of print books. Like, um, for instance, um, Eliza Calvert Hall wrote a book of handwoven coverlets. It was the first book that uh, Nona Ledbetter uh, gave me. She, when I saw her coverlets, she was a coverlet weaver in, in Vicksburg, Mississippi. She sent me home with that little book 
and it was written in the early 1900s, I think something around 1910, uh, 15, something like that. And Eliza had collected coverlets and she had inter there's interviews of some of the old weavers in Kentucky in those in that book and and their dye recipes that they use. And um, I, I swear I, I, I look for recipes like that in Mountain Homespun, um, Francis Goodrich's book um, in uh, North Carolina. It has dye recipes that you know, in, interviews from old dyers. And I find those sometimes uh, in museums. Um, I've been uh, researching right now, that's just been fascinating, is I go to uh, Western Carolina University, which is my university that's close to me. And um, I go, they have uh, some old journals that uh of, uh, from taken from stores like general stores in the area. And they go back to the 1830s to about 1870, 1880. And a friend and I, uh, and I have been going and going through the journals to looking to see what, if they were weavers, if they were, what they were buying. And what I have seen so far is they purchased a lot of alum Indigo, matter, and um, copperus. So, um, you know, that's what we're seeing right now, all the way back to the 1830s. Uh, um, I can't believe it's 104 right now. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm like, we're, I think we're all, <laughs> everybody's into listening to everything that you say. I'm, I'm fascinated by everything. Also, if anyone needs mulberry leaves and just happens to be in East LA, Marie Roncevel, will um, supply you with all the mulberry leaves that you need. So go see Marie. Um, She'll be inundated. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Cassie. I, it was such a great presentation. Um, we all learned so much. I wanna make sure too, I'm putting in the link, Jim Lyle's book, it's the art and craft of natural dying. That's the book that yes. you like. Yeah, okay. That's what mm -hmm. I've been putting in there. I didn't know if there were other ones by, by Jim, but. Yeah, we've got, we don't have tons of them in the st our bookstore right now, but we definitely have some. So um, go grab them, go grab a copy. But um, yeah, at this time, if you guys want to unmute yourselves and say hello and thank you to Cassie, you can. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Thanks. Thank y'all for listening. <laughs> it was, it was fun thank to you. listen. Incredible. You're amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, thank Great you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You've done so much stuff. It's overwhelming to listen to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know when um, Cassie and I were talking on, oh, well, we tried to talk on Tuesday and Wednesday, right, Cassie? Yes. <laughs> Some challenges, but uh, yeah, with the whole, all, all the work that you're doing with the flax and then the silkworms and then the analyzing coverlets. And the natural dying. I mean, there's just. Uh, I'm a, what is that? A type A personality? I'm definitely that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm never bored. I'll say that. That's good. That's it was good. wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, I was trying to stop the video and I stopped my own video. Stop the recording. Here we go.